This video is brought to you by Private Internet Access, and you'll hear more about them later in this video. When we talk about building one's self-confidence, I think the mistake that we make is that we look inside. I think the reality is when we try to build our self-confidence, we should be looking to our friends, we should be nursing our relationships. Mm. When I'm looking to build my self-confidence, the question is, Leadership is a responsibility to people around us. It's not a rank. Um, you've heard me say this yeah. before. I know many people who sit at the highest levels of organizations who are not leaders. Right. They have authority, and we do as they tell us because they have authority over us, but we would not follow them. Right. And I know many people, as do you, who sit at lower levels of organizations who have no formal authority, in that they've made a choice to look after the person to the left of them and look after the person to the right of them, and we would trust them and follow them anywhere. In other words, leadership can come from anywhere within, or or mm. within an organization. Yes, we have the right to demand <clears throat> to have better leaders and better leadership in our companies. But when we don't, quitting is not the only option, nor is simply complaining, mm. but undertaking the task of be becoming the leader we wish we had. Wow. You know, anyone at any level can, can become a student of leadership, and anyone at any level can choose to take uh, to, to, to look after this person and that person and work tirelessly to see that they rise, they become better versions of themselves, and that they show up to work inspired and go home feeling fulfilled and feel safe when they're at work because of us. Yeah. And though, though the organization itself may be dysfunctional, there are pockets, diamonds in the, in the coal mine. Um, and if you get enough of those pockets, the tail can actually wag the dog. Wow. So that's the great irony of all of this, which is the power belongs to the people. This is, a, this is just an anthropological truth. Sure. You know, the power always belongs to the people, which is why dictators bus in crowds to, to, to give the appearance that they're popular, or they actually have fake elections to give the appearance that they have a mandate. Dictators do that, wow. right? If if the if the people didn't have the power, dictators wouldn't need rallies and they wouldn't need elections, right? Right? Dictators fear the people, right? Because people have the power mm -hmm. in any op in any population in any organization. And what keeps dictators and bad leaders, authorities in power, is by keeping the people divided. Because if you can create mistrust amongst neighbors, mm. then the people can never come together and never depose the leader. And so if you look at any dictatorship wow. that ever existed, there are systems, look at East Germany during the Cold War. You know, we didn't know who was telling on us. So everybody kept to themselves and nobody trusted anybody, neighbors didn't trust neighbors, and that allows authoritarian organizations to, to do as they please. The people, it's when people come together, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not Congress that just woke up one day and decided the Civil Rights Act, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> it was thousands and thousands and thousands of people marching you know, in, in, in peaceful protest um, that put unbelievable pressure on a, on a, on a, on a, on a system to change. Mm -hmm. And anything that's ever happened in the world where there's been revolution or revolution happened this way. Yeah. People always have the power. And this is very true in the <clears throat> business as well. The people have the power. And so if we have mass layoffs on an annualized basis and you create internal competition, what you're doing is you're pitting people against people, especially if you create a system where we're only incentivized based on individual performance. So in a sales organization, for example, if my income literally depends on how many sales I get and you're going to, I'm going to keep stuff away. Right. Why would I help you? Yeah. Right? <clears throat> keep the people divided. You keep the system that we've got. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the people come together, good things happen. And so I'm a great believer that those of us who believe that there's a better way to build a, a corporate environment, those of us who believe that, we're, that, it, that, that, that being able to say, I love my job is a right, it's, a, it's not a privilege. It's not for a, a lucky few who get to go home at the end of the day and say, I love my job. Right. It's not some, some lottery that you win. You know, you know, you go to a dinner party and you ask somebody, do you like your job? And they go, I love my job. And we go, oh, you're so lucky. They didn't win anything. <laughs> right. right? It's not luck. Right. We are entitled. It is our it is our God given right to love going to work. Why is that? Because I think human beings are tribal animals, and all of us want to feel inspired. Um, we all want to feel like we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We all want to have some sort of physical and psychological safety, whether it's at home or work. Mm -hmm. You know. We, we fear war, we fear crime, and we, we want to feel psychologically safe at home. We want yeah. safety. And at the end of the day, every human being on the planet wants the feeling that I can provide for myself and my family. There's nobility in work. Mm -hmm. you know, um, 
um, handouts don't work and they and they destroy the human ego yeah. you know there's nobility in being able to to do a hard day's so worth of work and and collect a paycheck and when i do really well somebody says good job here's a little extra for you mm-hmm. because you're a valuable member of the tribe and we want to make sure that we're incentivizing the behavior that you're doing <clears throat> right. and the behavior you're doing is you're taking care of something bigger than yourself before there was corporate jobs yeah what were people doing? <clears throat> Do people feel entitled with, uh, or, or, or sorry, not, not entitled, but they feel like they were all working on their own before then? They no, were no, doing no. their own craft, they were doing stuff in the family, so, the tribe, what was happening so, before? So, so scale breaks things. Um, human beings, <clears throat> Homo sapiens, yeah. been on this planet mm, 50,000 years-ish, right? And for 40 of those 50,000 years, literally four-fifths of our, our time on this planet, we lived in populations that were uh, never larger than about 150 people. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And we didn't all live on top of each other. I mean, they were yeah. communities. Um, and the way we survived in these dangerous times was we took care of each other. You know, we contributed. Some people built things. Some people hunted for things. Some people made food. Some people, we, we took mm-hmm. care of the kids. We made their families. And, um, and, and the wealth was distributed. Um, um, you know, there's, there's, there's evidence they found in anthropological digs where the best cuts of meat, which you would think would go to all the alphas because I'm the strongest, I get to choose the food first, you know, um, the best cuts of meat, which they can tell by the bones, are actually distributed amongst mm. the tribe. In other words, the, the alphas, the leaders, yes, they were entitled to eat first. That's just the way we are. We're hierarchical animals. You know, nobody has a problem that somebody more senior, nobody has, a, nobody has visceral contempt for the idea that somebody more senior in an organization makes more money than me. Mm-hmm. We're okay with our alphas yeah. getting better treatment. Yeah. You know, nobody has a problem with celebrities, you know, making you know, more get, money, get, getting famous. Get, getting, getting a table in the restaurant that we have to right, wait for. Right, like, right. We're okay with it, <clears throat> yeah. you know? It, it's, it's one of the reasons we all try and, re, you know, increase our, our, our standing in, mm-hmm. in, in, in society by doing good and, you know, hopefully you do it in a good way, not just getting, you know, internet famous, yeah. which is getting <laughs> fame without any contribution to society, different subject. Right. Um, but it was, it was, a, it, was um, it was shared hardships, shared sacrifice for the good of each other. You know, that doesn't mean there wasn't ego and selfishness, mm-hmm. of course, but at the end of the day, we needed each other. Yeah. And then about 10 or 12,000 years ago, when we started farming, we didn't need to travel anymore. We could stay put. Um, and we could also sustain much larger populations um, than about 150 mm-hmm. um, because we could because we could amass resources. This also allowed for ruling classes and intelligentsia and things like that. You can have an entire group of people who didn't hunt and didn't gather; they just governed. Mm. You know, like it's a ruling class. That's right. what it is. Right. Or they just thought about it. <laughs> they became you know? philosophers. Yeah. <laughs> like you could, we, we had the resources for that and right. we were okay with it. And it's a good thing because look at the advancements in modern society mm-hmm. in the past 10,000 years simply because we, we couldn't, we, no, you didn't have to go toil the field. You, you could actually go invent yeah. something. You could innovate. You could yeah. innovate, right? So it's, it's a good thing. But scale breaks things for human beings. Yeah. You know, we were not naturally made for living in large populations. Um, and so the way it works best is when, when, we, when we organize into smaller groups, which is why hierarchy matters, which is why leadership training matters. Um, so you asked about, is the top person responsible? No. The top person is responsible for taking care of the people uh, in their direct responsibility and ensuring that they are charged with and incentivized to take care of the people uh, you know, with their direct responsibility, who are charged with and incentivized to take care of the people in their direct responsibility, and the people on the front lines who are actually doing all the work feel taken care of mm. and, and and are happy to contribute. Yeah. There's a Marine that I know, who's a Marine general, who says the way he can judge the quality of a lieutenant is he listens he listens to how the the, the troops talk about their lieutenant. So when he's not it, around. When is it when, when the, not, is it the lieutenant or is it our lieutenant? Ooh. They take possession of their leader. Wow. Right? That's our lieutenant. Right? Versus that's, it's always the colonel. It's never our colonel. It's always the colonel because there's no relationship. It's too, too distant. Right? Um, so as soon as we take possession, emotional possession of our leaders, there's a, there's a sign of devotion and mutual trust. But that relationship uh, starts with how the leader leads. Mm. You know, yes, we have a responsibility to give back, but we call you leader not because you have the rank. We call you leader because you took the risk to trust first. We, you, you took your, we call you leader because you took the risk to build the relationship first. You took the risk to create the circle of safety first. Mm. You took the risk to go head first towards the vision first. That's why we call you leader. 
because you undertook an element of risk. Mm. You, you literally lead. You went first. Right. right. Nothing to do with rank. Into the unknown first. Into the unknown, whatever it is, right? And, and then we have a responsibility to go, I'm coming. I support. You know, there's good followership too. The best leaders are actually the best followers. I've recently been traveling more around the world and I've had to work from a number of different Wi-Fi places. And when I learned that my private files could be accessed while using these unprotected Wi-Fi networks, I immediately started to research for a partner who could help. And after doing some homework, I found PIA, or Private Internet Access, which offers a cybersecurity tool called a VPN that reroutes your internet traffic through an encrypted tunnel allowing you to protect your privacy, secure your data, and access more content. It's pretty cool. Over 30 million people have downloaded PIA worldwide, which is a testament to the incredible service it provides. And let me give you a quick tour of this app. This is how you connect to the VPN, how you can switch between countries, and how you can unblock streaming and geo-restricted content. And right now, you can go to my custom URL below to get three years and four months of access for only $1.98 per month, which is 83% off. Plus, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So no matter the device you are working off of, PIA has got you covered too. They are all available on all platforms, including Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, iOS, and more. Make sure you are protecting yourself online and sign up with PIA today. The best leaders are actually the best followers. Mm. In what ways? What do you mean? Um, the best leaders never think that they're the final, that the buck stops with them. They always believe that they're in service to something bigger than themselves. And even if that leader, uh, the person in the leadership position gets to the tippy top of whatever organization, they still feel that they're subordinate to something even bigger, right? So uh, mm. uh, uh, the Pope does, still thinks that he's in service to something bigger than, than him, mm -hmm. right? A CEO of a visionary organization feels that they are still beholden to and, and, and following a vision bigger than them. So the best leaders actually are the best followers, even mm -hmm. if they're at the highest levels of, of the organization, they're still in service. Right, it may not be to a person, but to a cause, to a, a cause, mission, an idea, a, a vision, God, uh, something. whatever it is, there's still some sort of something that they're beholden to and they're devoted to and they're in service to. Um, so, so followership is a thing, mm. um, and um, not to belabor the Marine point, but uh, you know, Marines when they evaluate their leaders, they're looking good, for good leadership and good followership. So, for example, there when you go through OCS, Officer uh, Candidates uh, School selection, um, uh, when somebody's a, 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 for a task, you know, chosen to be the leader of that group for that task. The, the, the Marines are watching the others as well. So they're looking to see that everybody's contributing ideas. They're looking to see that that leader takes in those ideas but is decisive. And, and they're looking to see that the, the members of the group, if their idea isn't picked, they still give their all to see that the, that the leader's idea is successful. Mm. And if it fails, give it their all to pick up the pieces and, and see what they can do. As opposed to going, I, I told you. Right. Should have gone my way. <laughs> right, right. I was right. Or, or sabotaging because their idea didn't get picked. Wow. So they go all in. The, so, so good followership is is as important as good leadership. Mm. That that we re, we respect that that um, when a decision is made, we will we will give our blood, sweat, and tears to see that the decision our leaders have made will be successful. And if it fails, we will help pick up the pieces because that's the deal. What if you don't believe in the idea? You may not believe in the in the choice, but you right. better believe in the idea. Gotcha. You know, you better the greater, believe the greater idea, the, but the choice of getting yeah, and, there. And, and and that's just part of life. Yeah. You know, heck, man, I've disagreed with my own ideas. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've been pig-headed and dogmatic about this is the way we got to go, and everybody is wonderful and and, and then ten years later, kind you're of like, like falls apart and they're just like, <laughs> okay, yeah, I kind of screwed the pooch on that one. Yeah. But I take accountability. Yeah. You know, or we find in the middle. Somebody goes, hey, if we do this, we can probably be more successful, and we pivot. Mm -hmm. There's, there has to be, at the, at the decision-making ranks, there has to be a humility that the ideas don't always have to come from me. Right. Bob Gaylor, the fifth chief master sergeant of the Air Force, is the best definition of humility I've ever heard. He said, don't confuse humility with meekness. Humility is being open to the ideas of others. Mm. So 
you know, it's not about like, oh, shucks. That's not humility. <laughs> you know, right. you and I know some remarkable leaders, people of great power and authority, and they have huge egos. Yes. You know, they know they're good and they don't mind talking about how good yeah. they are. <laughs> but when somebody says, hey, I got an idea, they lean in like they're little kids. Mm. They go, Let, let's hear it. You know, I'm, I'm looking at some of the photographs on your wall and some of the folks that I know here, they have an insatiable curiosity for ideas. And even though they're unbelievably accomplished, mm. if you have something to share with them, they want to talk about it. Yeah. They, want, they want to hear about it. That's humility to me. You know, so it's not this, you know, it's not me. It's, you know, right. self-confidence is a good thing. Thinking you're better than everyone else, that's unhealthy. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> thinking you're good is healthy. Mm -hmm. Thinking you're better than others is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, humility is not thinking that you're uh, not good. How do you have a... Um, it's not thinking that you're... Yeah, how do you develop <clears throat> self-confidence? We're kind of going off here now, but I'm. this is a topic I'm really passionate about right now. I believe uh, self-doubt is one of the biggest killers to anyone's dreams. Yeah. So how does someone develop self-confidence and sustain it with the ever-going changes and stresses and uncertainties that always come up? Yeah. Once you reach a certain level, there's a new uncertainty. Yeah. So I, I think it's ironic that we call it self-confidence because I don't, for one, think it comes from the inside. I think our self-confidence comes from the outside, right? You mean that's the wrong way of going about it, or you think that's where it comes from in general? Uh, the, the, we are being misdirected by the name. When we say build your self-confidence, that's the instruction is saying go inside, look inside oneself. Mm -hmm. But I think that's I think that's a, I think that's a false direction. Children aren't born self-confident. Their confidence is built from their parents mm -hmm. and their friends and their teachers where they're rewarded when they do well and they're um, pushed when they fail, when they can do better. Simply, you know, we know this, that simply telling kids that they're great all the time actually doesn't build self-confidence, mm -hmm. actually does the, t the total opposite, right? right? Um, and I, for one, I can tell you, my, in my own experience, my own self-confidence, 100% um, uh, comes from the relationships that I have. Um, it's not some deep internal fortitude, you know. A, a world famous trapeze artist is not going to uh, uh, try a brand new death defying act for the first time without a net. So, it's the people in my life. Um, it's it's when when I do doubt myself mm. that somebody says, "You got this." When somebody says, "I believe in you," when somebody says. No matter what happens, whether it succeeds or fails, I'm going to be by your side. Oh, that's, that's when I have the confidence to do difficult things. Wow! Right? I don't have some natural battery that I that that just <laughs> right. You know that that to me is bravado. Yeah. I don't know if that's self confidence. You know, you know, being a huge risk taker is not an indication of self confidence to me. You know. Jumping out of a plane and jumping out of a plane with a parachute are two different things, right? Right. right. Um, um, to me, self-confidence is measured, and there should be a degree of of, of doubt. Um, but but I, I think true self-confidence, belief in oneself and belief in one's cause. You know, I could not do the things that I'm doing, and I would not have the strength um, to have made the sacrifices that I've made or continue to wake up on a daily basis to drive to spread this message um, if I were alone. Mm. And so when we talk about building one's self-confidence, I think the mistake that we make is that we look inside. I think the reality is when we try to build our self-confidence, we should be looking to our friends, we should be nursing our relationships. Mm. When I'm looking to build my self-confidence, the question is, who around me do I need to take care of? Mm. You know. The, w the way we build our self-confidence is by helping somebody else build theirs. Right. It's an act of, we will build our confidence with an act of service. So I, I'll tell you a true, a true story. So I did an experiment. I love doing experiments in my own life. Yeah, me too. You know, I have I mad thoughts. It. I'm like, well, let's try, <laughs> let's, let's, try, try. <laughs> let's try this one out. So I have a very dear friend who has stuck with me through thick and thin, who she is absolutely profoundly one of the reasons that I am who I am today, right? And I have my confidence in large part because of her, wow, okay. right? She's one of a, a small group of people who I, I look at and say, mm-hmm, yep, yep, good yeah, friend, right? Yeah. She was struggling, mm. like seriously struggling. Oh, let me take a step back. 
Um, so uh, we decided that we were going to. Uh, um, she look. She was she was struggling. She goes. She was going through some hard, hard things in her life. Career wasn't going the way she wanted. Her personal relationship mm. was struggling. There was a there was a lot of rough. She was lacking confidence. There was a lot of rough. Yeah. She was lacking confidence. Yeah. And um, we would get together on a regular basis, and I would attempt to coach her. Uh huh. You know. And she'd feel great for the hour after she left me, and then it would very quickly go back to normal. Right. And we'd get back together, and I would coach her, and she felt great for the hour after she left me, and then it would go back to normal. And I wouldn't, I can't say that there was some profound change being made in her life. Mm -hmm. So I had a harebrained idea. I went to her and I said, I need your help. I said, I I'm struggling. I don't have a coach that I, that I love and trust. Mm. You've known me for years. I trust you with, you know, with everything. Um, I feel unbelievably safe around you. I, can you put together a program and can you coach me? I think you're good at it. And I, it wasn't reciprocal. It was an I'll coach you, you coach me. I said, mm -hmm. I'm, it's just I, want, I, I need your help because yeah. I'm struggling. It was legit. It wasn't like I was just making stuff yeah, up. You were stressed. You know, it, was, it was legit. I, need, I could do with the help and I, yeah. and I trusted her to help me. And something profound started to happen. Over the course of just a few weeks, it wasn't even for a few months, but over the course of a few weeks, she started to gain way more confidence. Mm. Her career started to really move in a more positive direction. Her relationship firmed up. Um, and the more that she was in service to, to me, the more that she grew herself. Wow. So I think self-confidence, I, I wish we didn't call it self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, I think it gives a false direction. Uh, the way we build confidence um, uh, is with. You know, con means with, doesn't it? Mm, uh, interesting. Uh, so I, I have no idea the, the, ed the etymology of confidence. That's interesting. Just making stuff up here. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but con means with. The the. I mean, to confide. Let's mm. look this up because fidelity, f yeah. you know, f is is something to do with truth. So so confide, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. Look it up with the etymology of look up the etymology of confidence. You know. It's it's to to confide is is to is two people, like a conspiracy is a, is a co whisper. That's what conspiracy is the co whisper. So confidence is it's co fidelity. Right. What is so? I, let's on. see. Let's see if the instinct is is matched by the etymology of the word. And which if it isn't, uh, I'm still okay with it. Yeah. You, you look, what are you giving? What, what does it say? Uh, so it comes from con uh, late Middle English. Confident translations, origins, and meaning. Here we go. On light etymology dictionaries, gotta love it. Uh, um, where does the word come from? It's about trust or reliance. Mm -hmm. But what's the actual etymology of the word? Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and waste everybody's yeah, we time. Can look it up. <laughs> but it comes from uh, cum fidre, uh, and fidre means to trust. Mm. To trust yourself or trust so, other people. So or... cum, what does cum mean? Uh, uh, it means with. <laughs> with. It means with trust. Wow, that could be with trust with yourself. I think it's been mis. I, that's my point. I think it's been. Mm. I think it's like a conspiracy. Require a conspiracy ah. requires two people. You cannot have a conspiracy with one person. Mm. It, it's a co-whispering. Mm. You know, you commit the crime of conspiracy when you tell someone something, mm. and and you're both in on it. Right. So I think conf confidelity. Con, uh, confidence is the same thing. I think it's, I think it's at least two people who undertake the task of, of of trust and reliance. So she was coaching you, and you saw a change with over a few weeks of her her confidence, confidence built and her her, her belief confidence. in herself. Her belief in herself grew when she was in service to helping me, yeah. uh, to helping me. And so and so the, goes back to the root of the question: How do you build your self confidence? Mm -hmm. Or how do you overcome self-doubt? How do you overcome self-doubt? Help someone else overcome self-doubt. I love that. I love that. You overcome self-doubt by helping. By, and it's not a selfish thing. I'm only helping you so I can. Mm -hmm. You have to genuinely love and commit to the person. This person that you're helping, you have to genuinely care about their success and their confidence and, and, mm -hmm. and, and their lot in life. You said this. You said you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Mm. Uh, what are the systems you created to be successful beyond those kind of 
core habits right there. Yeah, so this is a really good question. I think first I just want to talk a little bit about that, that point that you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. What do I mean by that? So often when we set about to change something or to achieve something, the first step is almost always setting a goal. Uh, and this is coming from someone like, I was very goal oriented for a long time, right? Like You're I would set, yeah, I would set yeah. goals for the things I wanted to do in sports, the goals for the grades I wanted in class, <clears throat> the goals for how much money I wanted to make in my business. And sometimes I would achieve those, but then sometimes I wouldn't. And so I had this question like, well, clearly I'm setting goals for both, so like that can't be the thing that determines it. And you see this a lot, that the, the winners and losers in a particular domain often have the same goals. Like every Olympian wants to win a gold medal. Sure. Uh, every job candidate wants to get the job. So if the winners and the losers have same, the same goal, then the goal cannot be the thing that distinguishes the two. And the thing that distinguishes them is the process, the system behind the goal. And this is also important because achieving a goal often only changes your life for the moment. So like, you know, say you're, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just take like a simple example. Say you have a messy room, you know, and you set, you get motivated and you set the goal to clean your room. Well, you can do that in an hour and then you have a clean room. But if you don't change the sloppy habits that led to a messy room in the first place, then you just end up with a dirty room again. Yeah. So it's like treating a symptom without treating the cause. And um, habits are, are a better solution in that case because if you fix the inputs, the outputs fix themselves automatically, right? You don't have to fight uh, to have a clean room if you have clean habits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's true in a larger sense as well, right? Yeah. People want outcomes. They want to earn more money or lose weight or be more productive or reduce stress. But the outcome is not the thing that needs to change. It's the system that precedes it. Mm. So give me the, let's let's bust the myth of how many days it takes to set a habit. <laughs> because there's 14 days, 28 days, 60 days, yeah. a year. Right. If you do something every single day, and maybe it changes for each person, but what's the science or the, uh, the statistics say about how long it takes to form a positive or negative habit, I guess? So 21 days is the thing you hear all the time, 30 days, 100 days, whatever. Right now, 66 days is making the rounds is the latest. I saw time. that in another book. What was that book? Well, there was one study done that found that 66 days was the average uh, for how long it takes. And as a rule of thumb, I don't think it's terrible. Like you should remind mm -hmm. yourself, yeah, this is going to be months of work. It's not just going to yeah. be something quick. But even within that study, the range was quite wide. So if you did something simple, like drink a glass of water at lunch each day, it would take like three weeks. If you yeah. did something more difficult, like go for a run after work every day, that would be like seven or eight months. But I think actually that question to begin with is sort of a, there's like a broken mentality the behind it. The wrong question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because if you ask that question, the implicit assumption is, when do I have to stop working? Or when, when is this done? Um, and, and is it automatic after a certain period of time? Well, the honest answer to how long it takes to build a new habit is forever. Because if you stop, then it's no longer a habit. It's a constant choice and a decision, right? I think... People often look at habits as like a finish line to be crossed, but it's actually a lifestyle to be lived. Mm. And if you look at it as a lifestyle change, then you're saying, you know, okay, okay, what's something small and sustainable I can stick to, right? What's something that can actually last over time? Um, so it is true that, uh, and you can actually map this through research, that a habit will become more automatic with practice. But this reveals another important point, which is that there's nothing about the amount of time elapsed that leads to habits being built. You could practice something once in 30 days or you could practice it a thousand times. What actually leads to a habit becoming automatic and becoming learned and ingrained is repetition. So the phrase that I like to use is not 21 days or 30 days, but put in your reps. I mean, that, that's the real thing is you need to, you need to practice. And mm -hmm. if you put in your reps, then your brain starts to automate how that process works. Yeah. What makes you an expert on habits? Oh, man. Based on <laughs> lots of other people that are talking about habits. Why are you talking about it differently and what have you discovered that's different than everyone else? Okay, so two questions there. So the first one is expertise. Um, and I think that, and I've said this many times before, I'm just going through this with everybody else. Uh, I consider my readers my peers uh, in the sense that we're all just trying things out. The only difference is I write about what I learn and share it each week, mm -hmm. and, but we're all just learning along the way. Um, Early on, I had a feeling like that. I was like, who am I to, you know, I'm just a guy. Who am I to yeah. write about this? And I had a friend tell me, the way you develop expertise is by writing about it every week. So I wrote a, a new article about habits every Monday and Thursday for three years. And that was how I developed the expertise on the topic, was you, by yeah. writing about it. You did research. research. Right. And you said, here's what I found. Here's what I tried. 
here's what worked, what didn't work. It's a combination of me reading the scientific literature and reading the research and then trying to distill the practical insights from that and testing things out in my own life as a weightlifter, a travel photographer, a writer, an entrepreneur, and seeing what that looks like and then the two together. And I think you need both. Like I don't wanna be some new age version of an academic who's in an ivory tower just like theorizing about ideas. Is different what it looks like to put ideas into practice, mm -hmm. right? Like imagine you're a peak performance coach and you show up to coach like an NBA team. These guys are like, dude, you need to step on the court if you know what, right, to see what it's actually like. Um, so you need to have both to, okay. to have a firm understanding of that. So you were researching and you were applying it into your life. And what was the second part the of The second question, yep. which I think is probably the more interesting one, which is what makes my angle different? Mm -hmm. or what makes this different? Than every other book out there about habits. So you can broadly put books about habits into two categories. The first book, uh, the first category is what I'll call motivation models. So motivation models are about what sparks a behavior. How do you get started? How do you get motivated? The second category is what I'll call reinforcement models. So how does a habit stick? How does it last? Why do certain behaviors get reinforced? And sometimes books will touch on one, but focus primarily on the other. A lot of the time they'll just kind of live in separate worlds. That's what I would say is happening in like the self-improvement space. Then you have the academic space, so psychology or neuroscience or whatever. And a lot of those books are focused on the why, but not the how. They'll tell you, um, they'll tell you why something happens, why a particular neuron fires, why a particular biological process uh, works the way it does, but they don't tell you how to implement it in your daily life. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was try to combine the two. Why um, and how. Yes, a, why, a book that is both why and how. Um, why do habits form the way they do? Why are they important? And then how do they actually work? And uh, my hope is that Atomic Habits was able to do that largely because of the framework that I put together. So. In the book, I lay out these four stages that all habits go through. And I felt like we needed a new model because most of the models right now are either a motivation model or a reinforcement mm -hmm. model, but not both. Okay. And you need to understand what both sparks a habit and what makes a habit Maintains stick. Maintains it, yeah. yes. If you want to be able to understand how they work and right. how to make them last. And what are those four frameworks? So the first stage of every habit is a cue. The second stage is a craving or some kind of prediction that your brain makes. I'll give you an example of these in a second. The third stage is the response, and then the fourth stage is the reward. So mm -hmm. you walk into a, um, the question I had that, that no model I could find could solve in, in any good way or explain in any good way was, why can the same person respond to the same cue in a different way? So let's say you get into the habit of going to the gym at five o'clock every day. But then sometimes work gets busy and you don't go to the gym at five o'clock. Current models don't explain that very well because it's like, well, the queue is five, you should be going to the gym right now. It says you, the routine falls automatically after the queue. Um, or why, uh, why does someone walk into the kitchen and see a plate of cookies and then they automatically wanna eat it, but you could just as, imagine, uh, just as easily imagine that you just got done eating dinner in the other room and you're stuffed and you're full and you walk in and you see a plate of cookies and you're like, I'm stuffed, I don't wanna eat anything. So what's going on there? Mm. And I think these four stages explain it, which is you see the cue or you experience a cue and then your craving or your prediction differs based on your current state. So the way that you interpret the cues in your life is contingent upon the current state that you're in. The way you're feeling. Right. Um, and also other things like your beliefs mm. or your identity, the social group that you're part of, right? So like if you're in a different group, then maybe you interpret things in a different way. Um, you know, you can imagine one group, they practice a particular religion, they walk into a butcher shop and see pork and they don't, they're like, oh, we can't eat that. Right. Another person walks in and they're like, oh yeah, I'll have a pork sandwich because it's obvious and easy and right there. Um, so what you choose is contingent upon how you interpret the cues in your life. Mm. Um, so then, how do we change what we interpret? Yes, good question. All right, so this is a key point in the book, which is that social norms, society leans heavily on us all. So uh, if you, there are just broad examples of this. Family so, pressure, religious pressure, media pressure. All peer, kinds of stuff. Peer pressure, everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's say, so just some broad examples. Uh, you walk into an elevator and you turn mm -hmm. around to face the front. You have a job interview and you wear a suit and tie or a dress or something nice. There's no reason it has to be that way, right? Like you could face the back of the elevator. You could wear a swimsuit to a job interview, but you don't do that 
because it violates the shared norms of the group, mm -hmm. right? It violates the shared society, expectations yeah. of what that society has. But that's not that's true not only in a broad sense that we're part of these tribes, like big tribes, you know, what it means to be a Christian or to be American or to be uh, Australian or whatever, but it's also true in the small tribes that we belong to, what it means to be a neighbor on this street or a member of your local CrossFit gym or to volunteer for a local organization. All of those tribes, all of those groups that you belong to have a set of shared expectations, a set of shared norms. And the key, if you want to build habits that last, if you want to change the way that you interpret cues, is to join a group where your the desired behavior is the normal behavior, right? Like there are mm. there are plenty of people who they want to work out, but going to the gym feels like a lot to them. Uh, it feels hard, feels like a sacrifice. But there are also people who go to the gym every week and it's just normal. It doesn't feel like an obligation. That's the desired behavior is the normal behavior. It's their lifestyle. Right. Same thing for uh, musicians, you know, like if you want to learn an instrument, hang out with people who play all the time. You know, like if you hang out with a bunch of musicians, it's like, well, yeah, what we, we do. All yeah, day. we play four days a week. If we play seven days a week because yeah. it just happens. That's that's what the tribe does. The caveat to this and the thing that I don't see people mention a lot is that the reason social norms influence our behavior so much is because we want to belong to the tribe. We want to be friends mm -hmm. with those people. And so we don't want to lose the friendship or lose belonging over violating the norms. Yeah, you're not gonna hang out with a bunch of vegans and have pork right? and just like be the only one eating that. You won't hang out with them for very long because you're not right. gonna be friends with them anymore. Exactly. Right? They'll kick you out. So you wanna rise to the standard of that group, of that community. So the key, I think, is to join a group where your desired behavior is a normal behavior and you already have something else in common with that group. So uh, Steve Cam is a good example of this. So like Steve runs Nerd Fitness, right? And all these people wanna get in shape who are coming into his community but they also love Star Wars or Batman or Spider-Man or you know all these other things mm -hmm. that nerds are into. And if you show up, it can be intimidating to want to get in shape or you know work out the first time. But if you can connect with the group over your mutual love of Star Wars, then you're like, oh, well, I'm friends with these people. And now I also want to pick up those other habits with them because I want to belong with the group because we're already friends. And so I think you can apply that methodology mm -hmm. to most um, new tribes that you join. Don't just join a new tribe because they have the desired behavior. Also try to find a way that you can overlap with them. Find some shared context some other stuff too, yeah. that you can bond over and then it's easier to adopt like the habits. Musicians that like to be healthy. Yeah. If right? you want to do both, right? It's sure. like finding that even subgroup. It's like, hey, we love, you know, we love playing music, and then also you're gonna start eating better because we all want to eat healthy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, so that's the second part, the cue and then the desired craving. habits, yeah. right? The craving. Cue, craving, response, reward. Okay, and what's the response? So this is mostly about making it easy. Um, so this is the habit itself, and the easier a habit is, the less friction there's associated with a habit, the more likely you're gonna be to do it. So the way that I like to describe this, imagine you have like a hose, right, and there's a bend in the middle. There's a little bit of water trickling out. If you wanna increase the amount of water going through the hose, you have two options. You could either crank up the valve uh, and force more water through, or you could just remove the bend and let it flow through naturally. And a lot of the time, advice is centered on cranking up the valve. It's like you need to try harder, you need grit, you need perseverance, you need motivation, you need to overcome the obstacles in your life. And all those things are fine, but I think they're all short-term solutions. You might be able to do that for a day or a week, but I've never consistently seen someone stick to positive habits in a negative environment. It's really hard to fight that day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So uh, the solution, I think, is to reduce friction. And there are a ton of ways you can do this. Um, one way is just to scale the habit down, make it as easy as possible. So people have heard things like this before, start small, small steps, whatever. But even when you know you should start small, it's still really easy to start too big. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, say you want to get in shape and you're like, all right, I want to run a couple days a week, but I know I should start small, so I'll only run for 15 minutes. But even that is like way bigger than what I'm talking about. I mean, it should be so small that you, in the book I call it the two minute rule, but you should downscale any habit to fit within two minutes. Mm. So it's like, all right, I want to go for a run three days a week. My habit is I put on my running shoes and I step out the door. Anything else that happens after that is just bonus. It's a success. Now, yeah. sometimes people resist that because they're like, well, this sounds kind of like a mental trick, right? Like I know the real goal isn't just to put my shoes on. I know the real goal is to go for a run. So if you feel that way, my suggestion would be only do the first two minutes for the first few weeks. Because what you need to do is master the art of showing up. Like I had a, 
I had a reader who ended up losing over 100 pounds. And one of the things that he did was he went to the gym, but he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he would show up, be there, do like half an exercise. Five minutes would go, he'd leave. He did this for like six weeks. Wow. Now, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds silly because it's, it's like, the opposite. Just work out for a half hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what he was doing was mastering the art of showing up. And a habit must be established before it can be improved. Right? If you don't establish the habit, there's nothing to optimize. If you're not showing up at the gym every day, you don't even, who cares about what workout you're doing? You're not even there. Don't start running an hour a day if you've never run in a long time. Be the person who shows up and puts their running shoes on every day before you worry about how far you're running and what kind of workout you're doing and all that type of stuff. Um, a lot of times- Establish the, the art of showing up first before going all in on the desired goal you want. I think that's right. I mean. You can find examples of people who flip a switch and transform their lives or have an epiphany and do it overnight, That's but I really think that it's rare. Yeah. Um, I think that the more sustainable strategy, the more reliable strategy, is to scale it down to the first two minutes, focus on that, establish it, master the art of showing up, and mm -hmm. then go from there. So really you should like, usually when people think about building better habits, they optimize for the finish line, right? It's like, how much weight do I need to lose? How much money do I need to make? Um, you know, how, when can I finish this book? It's all focused on the result. But I think instead, if you optimize for the starting line, make it as easy as possible to start, scale it down, uh, organize your environment so that all that stuff is set up. This is another strategy for making it easy, which is that you can prime your environment to make the future action easier, right? Like if you chop up a bunch of vegetables and fruit on Sunday, it's now easier to have a healthy snack during the week. If you set your workout clothes out the night before, it's now easier to get into the workout the next day. But doing all that stuff to make it easy to show up that is probably the more important piece early on. There's also like all these, there are all these logistical details for building a habit that nobody thinks about in the beginning. Mm, like what? Well, like uh, take the example of uh, my reader who went to the gym. There, it's like, okay, what gym are you gonna go to? How are you gonna right. get there? Right. Are you going by yourself or are you gonna go with a friend? Do you need to? What time are you gonna go? Yeah, what time are you gonna go? Are you gonna have your own water bottle or is there a water fountain at the gym? Mm -hmm. And that stuff sounds like silly and small, but when someone's space, starting, right? yeah. the fact that like, oh, the gym doesn't have a water fountain and I always forget to bring my own, that's enough friction for someone to quit. Um, so by focusing on just the first two minutes, you figure all that stuff out. And then once you've got that piece mastered, now you can worry about how long the workout is and what program to right. do and all that stuff. So figuring out the logistics first is an important step. I think that's something that just comes naturally with scaling a habit down. Yeah. You, f you figure it's out easier. what's required to show up because you're not worried about the result or the outcome or how long you worked out or judging yourself for, mm -hmm. you know, for running 30 minutes when you should have run 45 or whatever. Got it. Okay. So this is the response still? Right. Okay. And what's the fourth? The fourth one, and this is crucial for getting a habit to stick, is the reward or the outcome. So every behavior is followed by some kind of outcome. This is just basic cause and effect. Um, and if the immediate outcome is favorable, is enjoyable, you have a reason to repeat it in the future. It's kind of like- Donuts. Mm. Yeah, exactly, Keep right? Repeating. It's like that example. If you, if, you, um, if you feel good, if you feel satisfied right after you do something, then it's like this positive emotional signal and it's like, yeah, I should do this again. Yeah. So you can see this actually, business is a really interesting example with this. There are a lot of products, and some of the most successful products have some type of immediate satisfaction that is layered into them. So uh, toothpaste is a very common example. There's no reason a toothpaste needs to taste like mint, but it does because the minty flavor and the refreshingness of it, it makes your, it gives your mouth this clean feel. Mm -hmm. It's more satisfying, so you have a reason to do it again in the future. Um, I heard an interesting one recently about car manufacturers that some of them are adding a fake guttural roar to the, the car or the truck when you press the accelerator because it just adds to the actual natural sound of the engine so it makes it more satisfying to mm. step on the gas and to drive the car. So there are a variety of examples like this, but if you can add, an, the key is it needs to be immediate, right? Mm. So like this is, um, in the book I refer to this as the cardinal rule of behavior change, which is behaviors that are immediately rewarded get repeated, behaviors that are immediately punished get avoided. And it's really about the speed of how quickly you feel successful. If it feels good, you have a reason to do it again. Um, is that why video games do so well? Video games are masters at this. They're masters at it. So um, they're masters actually at a variety of, of aspects related to habit formation. So mm -hmm. one is they're really good at this immediate satisfaction. There are all kinds of things. You're actually constantly getting feedback in a video game. A Even if you're just I, running, yeah. you hear the pitter-patter of the steps. It's 
that's gratifying. It's yeah. The jingles of like picking up another power up or um, you know seeing a kill or something like that. Whatever the game is, you're always getting constant feedback. Sound, uh, things that are on screen, they're really good at dripping out. Watching the the score increase in the top corner, that is immediate feedback. Um, so they they have all these different ways of making you feel satisfied, and when you see that progress, you have a reason to continue in the future. This is one of the one of the most effective forms of immediate satisfaction is progress. Mm. As soon as you feel progress, you have a reason to continue. It feels really good to see that you're making headway. I think if there's one skill to master in the 21st century, it's our ability to learn faster. Like, if there was a genie and a genie could grant you any one wish, but only one wish, what would you wish for? If there was only one wish, what would you wish for? It, you know, most people would say money or this or that, but you think learning is the, is I, the I mean, I think a lot of people I think being for, the matrix, like, Downloading the Matrix, yeah. so I could learn jujitsu in a second. Exactly, if I could learn a language in yeah. a second. If I like, could have this skill. So I think the the hack a lot of people would do is if it was any one wish, they would wish for more wishes, right? right. Exactly. They would ask for infinite wishes. So the equivalent, if I was your learning genie and I could grant you any one wish to learn any subject or any skill, just like become a master at it. The equivalent, what's the equivalent of the answer of asking for infinite wishes? It would be learning how to learn. Mm. Because if you can learn how to learn, the world is yours. Especially today, because nobody who's listening and watching gets paid for their brute strength, it's their brain strength. It's not your muscle power, it's completely your mind power. And the challenge is your brain doesn't come with an owner's manual, it's not user friendly, and that's the reason why I wrote this book. But the Limitless Model is an explanatory schema, a framework for learning anything faster, and not only that, but really for accessing our human potential. Because I think if there's one infinite, limitless resource on planet Earth, it's human capability. Mm. There's no limit on our determination, there's no, no limit to our imagination, there's no known limit to our creativity and yet we're not shown how to be able to access that. And so this framework is a three-part framework. And what I would offer everyone to do is, I love to turn this into a, like a little master class, okay. make it really engaging. And so don't listen passively, because we don't learn through, the human brain doesn't learn through consumption, it learns through creation and creativity and getting involved in things. And I know a lot of us learn faster when we actually roll up our sleeves and do it. So I would mm -hmm. encourage everybody as they're working out or cleaning the house or whatever they're doing at the same time, to try to get involved in this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think over. as an athlete, I can speak to that because for me in school, it was really hard to remember or learn things because I didn't feel like I was participating in a way that worked for me. But as an athlete playing basketball, yeah. when a coach would tell me, okay, I want you to watch this uh, video and then automatically shoot in a certain way with your hand positioned this way and fall through this way, just by watching a video and not actually implementing and practicing it, he would take me out on the court and we would practice it and do it over and over again and he would correct me and mm. I would learn through muscle memory as opposed to just watching something and then thinking I can do it without actually practicing. Right. So putting it into practice quickly for me is how I learned mm. sports and it's how I try to apply it in other areas of my life as opposed to just I'm gonna learn and then, okay, I know it. I feel like I need to work in it. I feel you. Get dirty, you know what I mean? I do, I do. I think a lot of people, this is the thing, it's not how smart you are, it's it's not literally not how like how smart you are, it's how are you smart. It's not how smart you are, or how smart your kids are, or how smart your business partner is. It's how are they smart, What's or the how are you smart. What's the difference? So you are smart through experiential learning. Mm. Like in the book we oh, talk how about- how are you smart, gotcha. Exactly, yeah. it's not how smart somebody is, like their IQ or their intelligence, it's how are they smart. And it's always context dependent. And so some people mm. learn, we talk about learning styles in the book, it's like, if. Have you ever been interested, just like you were saying, you're interested in a topic, but you're not getting it? Because yeah. sometimes the way you prefer to learn is different than the way the teacher prefers to teach. And mm -hmm. it's like you're two ships in the night and you pass each other and you don't even realize there's no connection. You don't even realize the other one is there mm -hmm. and it feels uncomfortable. Like if I asked everybody as an exercise to take out a piece of paper, I encourage everyone to take notes because I'm gonna drop a lot of like practical methods. Uh, when you're taking, if you were to write your name first and last on a piece of paper, actually you could do it right now, sure. first and last, and everyone encourage you to just to do this, or imagine you're writing your name first and last mm -hmm. on a piece of paper, and then when you're done, I want you to switch hands, and okay. in your opposite hand, There's right there. below it, write your first and last <laughs> name with your opposite. I don't even know if it would take me ten minutes. And so, so while bad. people are doing it, you'll notice when you're doing it with the opposite hand, as we're doing it, that's actually pretty good. 
that yeah. if I was to ask you which one is the which one was easier, first or second, and you would say the first was easier, mm -hmm. which one is is uh, more comfortable, first or last? The first one. The first one. So not only was it faster, it was easier, and then which one was higher quality? Let's check that out. This the. Now, first hopefully one, the, the first hopefully, one. Hopefully for the sure. first one's higher quality also yes. as well. And so here's the thing. That means the second time it took longer. The second time it also was not as comfortable. No. And the second time also the quality wasn't quite as good. Correct. And here's the thing, when I'm saying it's how you learn, some people are trying to learn something with the opposite hand. So mm. it takes longer, it feels weird, and the quality is not quite as good as opposed to if you're using your dominant hand. So how do we know how to learn with our dominant hand as opposed to the opposite hand? Yeah, and that's a metaphor for how we like to take yeah. in information. Some people like to learn by reading. Some people, they just cannot get through a book, though. They have to listen to that audio mm -hmm. or that podcast. Other people Or watch to... someone lecturing it or talking exactly. about it. Exactly. Yeah. And so we all have different styles, and it's not right or wrong. Now, we can actually improve our ability to read. We actually can improve our ability to listen and apply. So if there are areas where we feel weak, you know, this book is a guide a guidebook to be able to level up those areas mm. so you can be more of a whole brain learner also as well. But really when it comes to accelerated learning, it's not, again, how smart you are, it's how are you smart. And mm. that honors us and it takes the judgment out. Sometimes in school, it's like the top 10% get A's, another 10% get B's, and then 80% were like you and I. It's like right. it's like we're it's, it's like we're failing school as opposed to the way school maybe is failing uh -huh. us because school teaches you what to learn, what to focus on, what to think, what to remember, but not how to learn mm -hmm. and how to think. What well, teaches you how, how to focus. think and learn in one way. Exa right? Exactly. And when, when I talk about in the book, I talk about the, the, the four supervillains that are holding you back in your work, in your schooling, in your life is driven by technology. But one of them is digital deduction, where we're, where we're depending on technology to tell us what to think. We're not even using the children right now. They're finding that their reasoning abilities, their ability to analyze critical thinking is not as sharp as where mm. it should be because, <clears throat> because of technology, because technology is doing the thinking for us. And our mind, I'm gonna say this repeatedly, is like a muscle. It's use it or lose it. Mm. And just like when you go, you have a your personal trainer to make your muscles stronger, more energized, more flexible, more pliable, um, you know, more, you want your mental muscles to be stronger, more energized, more pliable, more, more flexible. Yeah. Of course. And so uh, many people refer to me as a brain coach because what I do is I, I train your brain because I think we're in the millennium of the mind. I mean, it's really about mental fitness, our ability to adapt, our ability <clears throat> to think, our ability to solve problems. And this really is everything. When people see me wearing brain shirts, all the time or pointing to my brain. The reason why I do that is because what you see, you take care of. You see your hair, you take care of your hair. You see your skin, you take care of your skin. You see your clothing, you take care of your clothing. You don't see your brain. Exactly, and that controls everything. And so when I point to the brain or honor it with their shirt, it's just like people have their emotions on their sleeve. You know, I have my brain on my chest right. because I want to put it forefront <clears throat> to remind people to love their brain, mm. to care for their brain. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's why a lot of people, uh, doctors and nutritionists, are talking about gut health. It's like we can't see it, but yeah. we can start to feel rashes or we can start to feel the effects of it. I think it's also heart health is a big thing right now. It's just it's like the emotional health, mm -hmm. self-care, self-love, you know, mental health and, and emotional health kind of tied together. And I love your work because you bring that to, to mm -hmm. everybody, to the world. And it's all connected. I talk about it in the book, you know, there's this heart intelligence and also your, your gut, as you mentioned, a lot of people call it your second brain. Mm. It's the second highest concentration of, of, of nerve cells. Really? And so, and, it, there's, and it's connected too. And, and sometimes and your, what you eat affects what, how you think. Mm. We know that because of the guests of we've had on our shows and everything else, that when you eat junk food, which is not, it's not really a thing. There's junk and then there, there's food. <laughs> there's sugar and there's food. Exactly. Yeah. And what you eat matters, especially for your gray matter. I remember in our yeah. previous episode we did years ago, I showed people how to memorize the brain foods and, and all of the best neuroprotectants. It's area of neuronutrition. It's really fascinating that your brain has different nutritional requirements than, than the, rest of, mm. the rest of your body. But I'm um, going back to the limitless model. Yep. There are three <clears throat> keys to reaching your goals. And this is my distinction here because originally, I remember years ago when you prompted me to write this book, you're like, mm -hmm. Jim, you know, it's been you know, over two decades. <laughs> you, you gotta you, do you, something. You put something in this book. 
And um, so because, you know, all, fundamentally, I'm a reading teacher. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, if somebody has decades, why I love reading, if somebody has decades of experience and they put it into a book like you, and all of a sudden people could read that book in a few days, they could download decades into days. Mm -hmm. And readers are leaders. We know that. And reading is to your mind what exercises your body. It's the mm -hmm. best mental fitness. And so the limitless model as an exercise, what I want everyone to do, so it's not hypothetical, because in part of the book, I demystify the, three, the seven lies of learning. There are seven lies that hold you back to learning. And one of them is knowledge is power. We hear that all the time. I've even said it also as well. But when we think about it, is it really true? Right? Is knowledge, just knowing something, give you power? No, not unless you act on it, not mm -hmm. unless you apply it. So yeah. knowledge times action equals, equals power. And so I would encourage everybody as you're listening to this to take immediate action. And there are three questions I want you to ask as you're listening to this episode to make it very valuable. And I would encourage you to write these down. Three master questions. Um, you know, we were talking about some of the um, famous actors that I work on mm -hmm. before we started filming. And uh, we were, you know, Will Smith did the cover endorsement of the book that says, you know, Jim Quick, you know, it gets the maximum out of me as a human being. I've learned so much from this this man, just being around mm. so many around around clients. Yeah. And what have you learned from Will? So one one of the things is this this idea of we were in uh, Toronto, and I help actors speed read scripts, help them to memorize their lines faster. I mean, you imagine like thirty pages of scripts. There's a lot of information. Can't lines. remember a sentence. Because there's a lot, right? <laughs> and it, it, some of them have their strategies, and and it, no matter how great somebody is. You know this because you study. You make you know your life about studying and researching greatness. Mm -hmm. It's they always know there's another level, yes. and they get really good at the fundamentals and the basics. But one of the things when we're when we're there, we spent the day together, and it was winter time in Toronto. They were filming from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Which can you imagine? Like so hard. Like Overnight. at night time, that, that's very difficult. But during the day, I, I went. We went through an exercise, and I believe. So in there, I talk about how we have 50 to 70 thousand thoughts a day. Right? And these thoughts are controlling our lives. And a lot of those thoughts are questions that we ask ourselves. You know, thinking is that process of asking and answering questions. Mm -hmm. And if people are asking, is that true? Notice you had to ask a question to define if it's true right, or not, right? right? And there's certain questions we ask more than any other question. Like what? So, so here's the thing. <clears throat> I talk about dominant questions, that you have one, two, three questions that you ask a lot. Of, and I want everyone to think about what your dominant questions are, including mm -hmm. you. And I'll give okay. you a couple of examples to get you started. So for example, I t uh, one of my friends, we went through this exercise of, of meditating and, and writing journaling down. We found out her dominant question is, how do I get people to like me? How do mm -hmm. I get people to like me? Now she asked that question all the time and you don't know anything about her. You don't know her age, you don't know her background, you don't know what she does for a living, you don't know what she looks like, you don't know where she lives, you don't know anything about her, but you know a lot about her. Mm. If you asked yourself, how do I get people to like me hundreds of times a day? What, what's her personality? What's her personality going to be like? What's her life going to be? Well, I guess it could be, it could be either side of the spectrum. She could be super outgoing and super adventurous to try to get people to be more attracted to her. Or yeah. she could be super shy and introverted because she's so worried about what people think about her. Yeah. So that's the first thing I thought of, but I'm yeah. not sure if that's true. And it's absolutely true. She actually does both of those things. Really? I mean, if you ask yourself, how do I get people to like me, then what are you doing? You're people pleasing all yeah, the time. Course. You're you're a sycophant, mm -hmm. um, just- uh, Saying you know, yes to everything. Yeah, or... you people take advantage of you because you're martyring yourself because mm -hmm. they're always trying to, you know, they're making themselves less than, or uh, or their their personality is never consistent because their personality changes. The chameleon, the, the exactly. change for people. Exactly, yeah. and you know all that about her and you only know one question she asks herself yeah. and that's one of her dominant questions. I would, I would offer everybody who's listening to this, what do you think your dominant question is? Because questions are the answer. You know this from the work mm -hmm. that you do in, in high performance and, and greatness, that the questions you ask determine what you focus on. You have part of your brain called the reticular activating system, RAS for short, and it's your filtering system. So at any given time, there's a billion stimuli that we could be paying attention to. And primarily, your brain is a deletion device. It's trying to keep information mm -hmm. out. Otherwise, you would go crazy, right, if you paid yeah. attention to everything. <laughs> yeah. So what gets in? So for example, years ago, my, my little sister, started sending me emails and postcards and pictures and photographs of a very specific kind of dog. It was a, a pug dog. You know those Cute little dogs. Exactly. Like men in black dog, right? Yes, exactly. Very smushy faces. They're very compliant. You could dress them up as ballerinas and they don't <laughs> they don't care. And 
and she starts, and I didn't know why. So my question was like, why is she sending me these pictures all the time? That became a, quite a dominant question of the day. And then uh, I realized her birthday was coming up. So mm -hmm. she's, a, she's a smart marketer, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Planting those seeds. And here's the magic though. I started seeing pug dogs everywhere. everywhere. I would go to the grocery store, I'd be checking out, and I swear to you, a woman's carrying a pug dog at the register. I would be running and jogging in my neighborhood and somebody's walking six pug dogs. Wow. Now my question for everybody is, where, where, where did these pug dogs magically appear all of a sudden in the world? No, they were always there, but they were not, I wasn't paying attention to them because mm -hmm. they weren't important because I wasn't asking that question. Once you ask a question, you start to pay attention to those things and that focus determines how you feel, yeah. determines your behaviors. And primarily, it's so interesting, it's kind of like social media. There's an algorithm to your mind, like mm. there's an algorithm to Facebook and Instagram, that what you engage with the most, you like and you share, you comment, you start seeing more of those kind of things, yeah. right? And so just like your mind, what you start engaging with, if you start watching all this news about fear and all the things that are going on, you start paying attention and your mind just starts focusing automatically, it becomes a, a reaction, a, yeah. a reflex. And you start to attract more of the fear and anxiety or worry that's in the world. That's being posted. Very much so. You so start I, to subscribe to whatever that is to receive more of it. Exactly. you're thinking about So it, just yeah. like on social media, if you start just liking all the cat stuff and everything else, they'll just start feeding you cat stuff. Right. And same thing with negativity and same thing with opportunity mm -hmm. also as well. So the questions make a difference. So questions are the answer. What are the two questions you've been, that are dominant in your mind yeah. over the last five years the most? Yeah. So for learning, because I grew up with the broken brain, many mm -hmm. people know my, my story from the last episode. When they see me do these demonstrations at Summit Series or it's, uh, you know events, you and I have remembering just, a thousand per people's names, right? In all, Ten minutes, all of that kind of stuff. stuff. Yeah. I say that I don't do this to impress you. I do this to express to you what's possible. Because the truth is, we could all do that and a whole lot more. Yeah. We just weren't taught. Yeah. If anything, we're taught a lie that somehow our intelligence is fixed, like our shoe size. But I do it as a demonstration because I grew up with learning difficulties. Right? Mm -hmm. I had my brain injury when I was five. I fell, had a very bad fall when I was in kindergarten. Um, rushed to the hospital wow. before I was curious and very energized my parents would say but then I became very shut down and my superpower growing up was being invisible it was shrinking because I didn't want the wow. spotlight I didn't want to be called on so I was literally physiologically I was always trying to look smaller to protect myself so teachers wouldn't call on me or wow. I wouldn't be bullied or something like that and I would do that as well, except for I was just a giant in the class. So right, I right. Know how to do that. So I was I always would, picked on. <laughs> so for me, I would actually be sitting behind you, yeah. and I would, I would, I would be guaranteed no one would exactly. be able to see me. But going back to my, my question, my question became all the time, first of all, when I was nine years old, I was slowing the class down, and a teacher pointed to me and said, that's the boy with the broken brain. Mm. And that label became my limit. And so we have, they think about when you're listening to this, what are the labels that we put on ourselves? It's like we're not born, we're born with a blank slate, right? But through experience, through expectations of other people, um, through our environment, we learned that we are limited. Yeah. And the good news is we can unlearn it. And yeah. that's, that's, that's the point of the book. But because I was in the broken state, I would always ask myself, you know, you know why, am I, why, why am I broken? Why am I the stupid one? And I started getting answers of why I'm so stupid, right? And I would, every time I did badly on a test, I would be like, oh, because I have the broken brain. Right? If I was in, pick, in sports, I'd be like, oh, because I'm the broken one. And that became my self-talk. Adults have to be very careful with their external words because they become a child's internal words. But mm. later, I mm. started to get so frustrated. I started asking, getting curious. And when you're curious, you start to ask different questions. I was like, why, why is that person so, why, why are, they, are they so smart? And how come I'm studying three times harder and getting mm -hmm. less grades than, than them, right. right? And I started getting answers. My primary question started, my dominant question ended up being like, how do I make this better? But the three questions that I focus on, and uh, let me tell you first what Will's is, Will Smith's, one of his dominant questions when we went through this exercise is, how do I make this moment even more magical? Mm. How do I make this moment even more magical? It used to be how do every I make moment or like an acting this moment, this any, no, any, every any moment, any moment. Wow. like and and it shows up right in his in his life because later that night when we're filming it was like two o'clock in the morning and his family we were all outside for the superhero movie that many people know of and it was, it was really cold because it was in Toronto and it was it was winter time and we're all just waiting. 
and just waiting and waiting and waiting because people think that and you meet all these people all the time on your show mm -hmm. and, and you, they think it's so glamorous no. they're just, just hurry up and wait exactly yeah. and, I, and I asked him this question because I believe genius leaves clues I was like you know how do you how do you prepare how do you get ready when the director you're just sitting here for hours and then the director calls on you how do you get ready and he was like Jim I don't have to get ready I stay ready. That's good and line. I'm like, wow, that's it's good to be Will Smith. <laughs> it's hard to stay ready for six hours yeah, of waiting. Exactly. Though. But that's just who he is because mm. I believe the life you live are the lessons you teach. Mm. The life you live mm -hmm. are the lessons you teach others. Yeah. But going back to his dominant question, his family was there also at the same time visiting the set and um, you know, from West Philly, you know, you know, you know the song. Yes. And we're all outside and shivering. And when he wasn't shooting, he would he would bring us blankets. He would make hot chocolate and bring it to us. He would crack jokes. He would live that that dominant question, because the life he lives. He like, how do I make this moment even more magical? Now, you, before it was like, how do I make this moment magical? Then we we played with it like even more magical, mm. presuming it is already magical nice. and amazing. And so these questions we ask are very important. Now there are three questions when I said there's turning knowledge into power that I want everyone to obsess about. I mean, this will make you a master. Okay. And if you get it, this is it. Three questions to turn knowledge into power because knowledge alone is potential power. Number one, how can I use this? When you're listening to this podcast moving forward, uh, every time you listen to it, I want you to ask yourself, how can I use this? Get obsessed about this, mm -hmm. like even write it down. And this is where your mind can be very creative because in here I teach a power of uh, note taking because people don't realize this. When you listen to a podcast or you go to you know, a summit or an event or have a great conversation with somebody, within two days, 80% of it is gone. Mm -hmm. We forget it. They call it the forgetting curve. And one of the ways to retain it is to by taking notes, exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Now, I encourage people to take notes a very specific way, is to take put a line right down the page. Okay. And on the left side of the page, I want you to take notes. And on the right side, I want you to make notes. So on the left side of the page, you're taking notes. You're you're so capturing, list the right. You're capturing quotes, information. The, yeah. You're like, this is how Jim remembers name. This is how Jim reads a you know a book a day or whatever it is. So you're on the left side, you're capturing, but on the right side, you're creating. Now that's a subtle difference. On the left side, you're note taking. On the right side, you're note making. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Again, on the left side, you're taking notes. You're writing down the quotes and the strategies, the processes. But on your right side, what you're doing, the right side creativity, instead of your mind being distracted when you're listening, have it be distracted on, focused on, how can I use this? The, on the right side is where you're writing your impressions of what you're learning. How can I use this? Another mm -hmm. great question, second dominant question I would ask, is not only how can I use it, because you come up with all these answers, just like I see, you start seeing pug dogs everywhere. It's like, oh, this is how I could use this in my relationship. This is how I could use it you know, in my career. Second question I would ask is why must I use this? Why must I use this? You know, We know uh, one of the uh, people that endorsed my book, he's on your show, is Simon Sinek. Mm, and you know, one of my favorite books, I'm gonna mention a lot of books, including your own, start with, you know, his is start with why, yeah. right? And so why must I use this? So once you have all these ideas of how can I use this, why must I use this? Because if you don't have the reasons, you won't get the results. Right, you won't Re care enough about it. Exactly, yeah. reasons reap results. I'm gonna give a lot of people a lot of quickisms here. Because it goes from your head, to your heart, to your hands. You could affirm things in your head all day, set goals in your head all day, but if you're not acting with your hands, you're procrastinating, putting things off, check in with your second age, which is your heart which are the emotions, right? Because we are not mm. logical, we are biological. Dopamine, mm. oxytocin, serotonin, That's endorphins, these, this chemical soup drives us to act. Just like people don't buy logically, they don't fall in love logically, they do these things emotionally. So find your emotions. And in this book, we do, we really uncover and I decode motivation. Mm. Not motivation getting hyped up and dancing on chairs and then the next day not changing. We figured out this formula of sustainable motivation mm. in, in this book. But the second question is, go back to why must I use this? Because if you don't have the why, you won't do the what. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the third question. First question, how can I use this? Write all the answers down, think about that. Second question, why must I use it? Gives you the energy and the fuel and the drive to do it. And finally, when will I use this? Mm -hmm. When will I use this? Because we know that one of the most important performance productivity tools that we have is our calendar. 
Yeah. Right. If it's not in our calendar, we it just get doesn't it done. get done. Yeah. How many people will go? You put doctor's appointments there. You put, you know, PTA meetings. You put meetings with your investor there. But are you are you scheduling your real your workout? Are you scheduling your meditation time? Mm -hmm. Are you scheduling your journal or your white space just so you can be a creative thinker? And if we don't write it down, it comes at the end, and then you just, you know, you never get to yeah. it. And so those are the three dominant questions that you want to ask to take knowledge and turn them into power. Wow. So as you're going through this, ask those questions, you'll get better answers and you'll learn it deeper. It'll deepen into your nervous system so much more. High performers seek clarity more often than their peers. Mm. And what that means for them is every situation they go into, they're seeking clarity and setting intention. And it's not like once in a while, they're doing it way more often. It's like, uh, uh, you, you know, I've been blessed to work with Oprah Winfrey. When she has a meeting, at the start of every meeting, she asks, what's our intention here? Mm. What's the intention of this meeting? Not what's the agenda, what do I do? What's the intention? That's every meeting. So mm. she's seeking clarity at the beginning of every meeting. That's why she's so amazing, right? If you think about her whole career, she was always trying to have people seek clarity on who they were so they could be themselves. That's what high performers are doing. They just do it more often. They seek clarity before they shoot that video, before they have the podcast interview. Um, but specifically, we found three practices to help you get better at seeking clarity. Uh, number one, they are seeking clarity in what we call the future four. So you've probably heard that successful people are more future-minded. Mm -hmm. It's true. And specifically what they're looking at, if you talk to a high performer, they're more clear about um, who do I want to be in this upcoming situation? And by the way, it's not about who I am. It's about who do I want to be. They're more future oriented. They're more intentional about who they want to be in social situations. So it's like, I want to have this type of interaction with Lewis today. Mm -hmm. that, that's intentional. They're more clear about what skills they need to develop mm. to reach their next level of success. Right. Here's how you really know an underperformer. Open up their calendar and look for any evidence that they have planned their own curriculum for greatness. If they don't have classes or courses, if, they, if they're not actively skill building, there's no chance at high performance. Mm. I mean, maybe they can dumb luck into it for initial success, but high performance is long-term success. You got to be building your constantly skill Constantly growing, constantly yes. learning, constantly growing. Being aware of that. And the last of the future four is, I know the service I want to provide in the future. Talk to any high performers, I'm sure you've interviewed, they kind of know the service and the difference they want to make. Maybe not precisely, but they're asking the question. Mm -hmm. So that's some of what we know. They, they seek clarity. Um, and that's kind of the first practice is asking questions in those areas. Mm -hmm. And the other two real fast is uh, when you're seeking clarity, they're more clear about the feeling they want to have. Like an Olympic sprinter who's won gold is more likely to have said before he went or she went on the track, how do I want to feel out there? Not like just the result, like when I, mm -hmm. when the foot's in the block and I'm arms down, like what do I want to feel? Mm -hmm. Like they're very aware of the feeling they're trying to get. Yeah, I don't want to feel nervous and stressed. I want to feel calm and yes. clear and smooth. And Yes, yeah, yeah. and they're, they're doing that self-talk, which mm -hmm. is seeking clarity. And then the last one, which is really important, they're, they're clear about what's meaningful to them now and what might be different in the future, which is something I didn't know until we did a lot of the interviews or the conversations is uh, a lot of people kind of know what I like now. They know what their passion is, but it's like, what's going to be meaningful to you later? Like in five years, they've thought about that. And, you know, I would say they, they, you know, they've done the work. So that's just the first habit. Mm. And so the book kind of opens with, with that story of like finding what's, we, we all have to decide who we are and what we want and how to get it at this stage of our life. And when we don't know that, you know, reaching high performance can be really hard. Yeah. It's all about clear vision for me. It's the first yes. chapter in my book is yes. the greatest leaders in the world have a clear vision. Love that. Yeah. That's it. And they got that vision by seeking clarity. Yes. That was the habit that gave them the vision. Mm -hmm. They were consistently seeking, like, how do I, what do I, I mean, they ask themselves more questions. Mm -hmm. That's one of our findings. They literally are doing more of the self-talk, asking more of the questions, which is so important. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you, I love how you talked about this. You say the world cares less about your strengths and personality than about your service and meaningful contributions. 
then mm-hmm. why do so many of us focus on our strengths and personality? Yeah. Do you oh, think? that was a huge finding. I, and I would have, that's another one. I would have completely freaked out <laughs> on anybody. Strength finders, all these other books yes. out there, you know, it's like, yes, we focus on our strengths. And unfortunately one, that's, in the history of personal development, that is the greatest false dichotomy that ever mm-hmm. has ever been. Focus mm-hmm. on your strengths, or your, it's like you have to do both. You have to do both. But what we found in our research, which surprised me, high performers do not report working on their strengths any more than regular people. Mm-hmm. So that's not what gives them the edge. Uh, one of the chapters opens up with this guy who wrote this email, really highly successful guy, and he wrote this email to me. Says, you know, and I'd put him through all this. I put him through Strengths Finder. The Berkman, uh-huh. the Colby, the Myers Briggs, yeah, put him yeah. there everything. This is one of my first coaching clients ever. I knew everything about him. Mm-hmm. We knew all his background. We did all the, we did all the homework. Had his peer review, you know, his 360 assessments from work. And then I watched him fail for two years. Mm. And he wrote me this email and he said, Brendan, stop telling me like what successful people are like because we know my strengths, so I'm not getting ahead. And start telling me what they do. And that's what this book became out. It's like, what do you need to do? Mm. Because in, in this email he wrote this, which is where that finding came from, he said this was so good. Listen to this line. He said, as a leader, I have to be honest with myself that my mission and vision should never be made to bow down to my limited human strengths. I should have to rise up to my mission or vision. The strengths aren't the relevant thing is, the question is, what is necessary for me to develop into to reach that mission? Mm. It's like, your strengths are great. And right. it's like, yes, of course do your strengths. But that's kind of like, what I tell people is like, uh, <laughs> if it, let's imagine you have a bear. And that bear wants to go on top of this cliff over here. And it's never been on the cliff. And it wants to get that new honey up there, mm-hmm. Right. Telling the bear to focus on the strengths, to go somewhere it's never gone before and do something it's never done before is stupid. It's like saying, <laughs> hey, you know what? Just try being more of a bear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I just, you say, Brent, I got this big new vision. I just say, just try being more of Lewis. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a spiritual level that feels good, mm-hmm. but you and I both know you're going to have to develop far beyond your comfort zones. Yeah. And strengths are typically comfort zones. Yeah. We got to overcome that and go to the next level. And develop new skills and overcome certain fears and all these other things that are going to help us get to the next level. Is yes. that right? Or, yeah. 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 The whole conversation of beyond the comfort zone really requires us to go beyond our strengths. Mm-hmm. It really requires that us. That is to, our comfort zone. That is our comfort zone. What we already know, what we're good at. And the yeah. problem with all the strengths finder and all of the strengths based movement is the assumption, and they're all written academically this way, based on what are called innate strengths. And innate strength is the assumption that you had that from birth. And that those innate strengths are what you focus on. And I'm like, well, if you had it at birth, you probably had it when you were 15 years old too. So if it's innate, you had it at 15. Are the strengths you had at 15 sufficient to serve you at 50? Mm. Hell no. You need to develop beyond what's innate and go to a whole other level. And so uh, I take on strengths right. in, in the book in that way. Uh, because, But I also say it almost doesn't matter. Because a lot of people have strengths and they suck at work because they're not doing these habits. Mm. A lot, I mean, how many people do you know, I know who are amazingly sure, sure. strong and they, their strengths finders are amazing and they don't do anything all day. That's it. Yeah. A lot of people. I mean, people. in the sports world, there's a lot of great, talented people who had the greatest gifts, but they still weren't able to, to win. Yeah. Or they were lazy or they wouldn't, you know, hustle or sacrifice their body because they just relied on their talents, yep. their strengths. Yep. And so they were never able to get to the championship game or get on the best teams because – and they had all the talent in the world. And you're just like, if I was as gifted as this person, I would be incredible. Yes. You know? yes. I mean, that's the uh, whole thing about the talent code mm-hmm. or a lot of new sort of newer research and performance. It just says what's more important is what you do with what you got to develop into the vision of the mission you need to serve. Mm-hmm. And so the book kind of lays out a lot of the science behind that yeah. and then goes into, you know, obviously most of it's oriented towards the six habits. Mm-hmm. So in terms of clarity, what is that habit that you take on on a daily or monthly basis with habit, uh, with clarity? What do you think about? You're like every morning, what am I clear about? Or, yeah. you know, how um, do you apply that habit to your life? Uh, I apply it in a couple of ways. First, for me, uh, every situation I go into, I'm consistently asking like, what, what's the feeling I want to have here. If you ever see me teach, it's often, I would say, bring the joy. So I have joy triggers that I've set up in my mind that makes me more intentional mm. about things. So for example, I have a door frame trigger, 
Whenever I walk through a door, I say, bring the joy. So when I walk through that door right there, it's mm. like, bring the joy into this room. It's just a, it's just a mental trigger that I've set up mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. Every morning in the shower, I ask myself three questions. And not that I shower every morning, but <laughs> <laughs> the ones I do. I, the first question I say, what can I be excited about today? So it forces me to be clear about what's going to draw joy, enthusiasm from me. Mm -hmm. Number two, I say, what might trip me up today? Because usually I know what's going on in the day. I'm like, what, what might mess me up? What might, where am I not perform well? What might bother me? And number three, I say, what can I do to surprise somebody today? Hmm. To give a gift of appreciation or acknowledgement today. And so I think through that in the morning. So I think that helps me begin my day pretty clear. Um, then when I sit down before I do work, I literally look at my calendar of the day. I this morning. And I look at whatever's going on in the day. And I think about it for 20 minutes. It's one of my 20-minute routines in the morning. I literally... Think about my calendar mm. for 20 minutes a day. People think that's crazy. But what I'm thinking through when I'm looking at the calendar, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have that call. What do I want to happen on that call? You know, what's my intention for that call? What's my goal for that call? What's the feeling for that call? How do I want to end that call? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to have that time with Lewis. Like, how do I want to be there? And, and, and how can I make sure I enjoy it? Because it's a big deal. Mm. You know, I love your show. I, I want to do a good job. I, I want to share something good for the people, even though I have no idea what you're going to ask. In, right, right. In this. I, just, I, want, I want to be present for that and, and make sure I, I'm, I'm really there, even though maybe I have a head cold today. You know, it's like, that, that, it's like just thinking through it. I think that helps me. It keeps me asking questions. Every Sunday, I do a life arenas assessment. That just means I think there's 10 areas of our life and I score myself in them. Mm -hmm. And this is about my 11th year of doing this. Wow. So each area of my life, you know, from from emotional quality to happiness, to relationships, to time, to hobby, et cetera. I just give myself a score of one to 10. And one means I suck. <laughs> and I, I was horrible in the previous week on that. 10 means I did a good job. And then I ask, how can I do better? Mm -hmm. It's my Sunday routine. Yeah. And it just keeps me clear. And it's not like I don't sometimes like everyone else, you know, wonder what's going on or what I'm doing. But those habits, those were my habits. You have to establish your own for seeking clarity. Right. But when you have them, you weaponize your life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Clarity, powerful thing. Without clarity, it's hard to achieve a dream. Yeah. It's hard to, to get better. It's hard to grow and, and be a high performer. Yeah, no clarity, no change. That's it. No goals, no growth. That's it. Uh, the second one that I see here is energy. Yeah. What do you mean by energy? Uh, so in is the way we peak energy, high, high energy all day long. Yeah, no, it's just... not caffeinated energy, yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's the, the habit is generate energy. Mm, okay. Not necessarily have energy. Create energy. Create energy. And what they do, what, the way we measure that was kind of academic. Mental energy, which is tied to your focus and your stamina and your ability to manage complex tasks without too much mental stress. Uh, number two is emotional energy which is just the quality of your positive emotions. And number three is physical energy. High performers are 40% more likely to work out five times per week than the rest of their peers. So that means the top 15% most high performing people in the world tend to work out five days per week. Mm. Uh, and that workout could be defined as, you know, 45 minute brisk walk or, you know, hit intensity or whatever it is, but 40% more likely, that's a huge finding. And what we found is high performers just have better well-being and happiness and physical conditioning than everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, one stunning finding was uh, CEOs, senior executives, and business owners, they report expending as much energy as athletes who are competitive now. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I was surprised by that. I would have thought, you know, athletes would be 10% more. I mean, the emotional and mental energy yeah. they have to, the decision-making, the conversations, the big deals, the stakeness. Yeah. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot. And that's why, I mean, if you really want to achieve your dreams, you have to care for your body. Yeah. Your mind. It's why all these things, you know, finally resonating in the marketplace because the science of meditation or taking a break or, you know, uh, Sleep, managing your sleep. own energy, sleep is everything. Yeah. Um, and I think all of that is really important. And mm -hmm. we say generate energy because there's this myth that, you know, some people have happiness or they have, it's like, no, you generate it. You don't have happiness. You generate Created, it. Create it. Yeah. You create it. And so 
the quality of your energy you have to create. Like you and I both, I mean, if most of our audience knew our schedules, your schedule the last <laughs> yeah. five days is like, yeah, yeah. how is Lewis even able to focus <laughs> yeah. right now? And how are you able to get here and, and do this as well? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's because we say, well, this is our mission. Mm -hmm. Show up, man. Yeah, it's you it. know, there's plenty of times I got to imagine you walked on the field and you were like, I'm spent. Exhausted. You know, yeah, yeah. I remember when you like flew down to compete in yeah, South I still America. Play with, yeah. I still play with the USA team handball yeah. uh, team. And a year ago I, I flew down to, I remember I did an interview in Miami and then flew out from Miami and then went and just went right into training camp and then oh. played against Brazil, which is like, you know, Olympic, Olympic qualifiers and yeah. got our asses booked. But it was fun, you know. But you, I had to have clarity yeah, and energy show and show up, even when I was like, oh, we're going to lose. Yeah. Like there's zero chance. Yeah. It was like the worst team in the NBA playing like the, the Warriors. And we were just like, we had no chance. Yeah. But I had to show up and give my best. And, and yeah. you have to set all these routines. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, the amount of routines that Tom Brady has in his oh, life so that he can generate energy. It's unbelievable. Stuns most people. It's unbelievable. And that's just the, that's the that's thing. That's what it takes if you that's want to be at that level. If you don't want to be at that level, you don't have to do it. Yeah, you don't have to do it. I mean, everybody can just like, well, I'm going to go, you know, hit the Cinnabon. But it's like, yeah, yeah. it's, it's pretty like, good. <laughs> how do you want to feel at three o'clock? Yes. If you want to feel amazing at three o'clock, don't end lunch with a Cinnabon. You know, it's like, crazy. You have to <laughs> Gosh, it's crazy. Like I'm 34 now and I, w I could eat like sugar and bad food for oh my gosh. all my 20s. Right. Yeah. And now when I go off of sugar for like a month and then I just binge for a day, it's like I literally can't walk the next day. My <laughs> back know, is like so stiff. Sugar like, oh my gosh, like my whole body is exhausted. Inflammation. So much inflammation. Yes. Once I cut it out and then I bring it back, I'm like, yeah. oh, I feel so old. Yeah. Well, and, uh, dude, I'm the same way at my seminars. Like I, you know, we do four day event and it's just me. Whew. I usually have one or two big names come in, but it's me 12 hours a day, four days. Teaching. And I never sit down. High energy. I never yeah. sit down on stage. And super high energy. I mean, really going for it. Not just the clapping and the jumping, mm -hmm. but really just spending heart. You know how hard it is. Of course. And uh, I had to, about the same time, when I was 35, I had a, a, a famous strength and conditioning coach backstage. He works with me in Usher. And, and he, uh, he's like, what do you eat back here? And, you know, another guy came in and strapped the heart rate monitor machine. He goes, I'm equivalently burning, uh, equivalently working out at the marathon level every day. For four days. Mm. They're like, you're not eating. I was losing, on average, 11 pounds in my Crazy. seminars. Every, and I do eight events a year. So I was losing 88 pounds a year. You know, <laughs> it was like, uh, it's horrible for your health. So I had to learn how to eat. I had to learn, I do ice baths every night at my events, mm. which smart. no one loves to Dude, do that. I, but, here's the thing. I used to do it every day in football, like during the season. Yeah. And we, it sucks for the first month, but then you start to love it. Yes. Yeah. I have to do it. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. you just start to, ah, uh, it feels so good. So. feels so good. And after stage, you know, That's it's like best. 12 hours. So those are, no one says I want a habit of taking an ice bath at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But if I want to be high performing on stage, that's the choice. Yeah. Now, obviously, people listening, you know, consult your doctor. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and only do it for 10 minutes. Don't right, stay right. in for a half hour. Yeah. Right, right. So, but all those things you have to, you so have what energy. are your habits for energy? And the funny thing is you sit down with high performers, they know them. They can tell you, I do this, 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 this. And you're like, man, you're on your game. You got it down. Yeah. And they're always probably looking to improve it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. They're always, but they're very Tweaking. aware of it. And they, and they, what I found was they get pissy if they're off it. Yeah, of course. I didn't meditate this morning and I was like, ah, you know, I was kind of frustrated a little bit. Someone asked me when we were at our meeting today at the Soho House, he was like, how was your meditation? Because he knows I like to meditate. And I was like, you know, I missed this morning. I did yesterday, but I missed this morning. It's agitating when I miss yes. one of my habits. Yes. It's like, ugh, I That's, need to get up that, earlier. And yeah. That is exactly what you just said. It, 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 it just, it really agitates high performers when they're off their energetic habits. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the third big Per, uh, personal habit, which, by the way, I've been teaching high performance for a decade. Uh, we have the number one seminar on that and uh, the number one online course. And I was wrong. I never knew this was a thing. And you're going to laugh because you're like, duh, dude, I could have sat you down. <laughs> but I just didn't know. I, I knew I, I taught it as like a subtext, but I didn't know it was the thing. And that is high performers raise necessity. And what that means is they raise the necessity of performance in their mind before each performance. They say, I got to do great. And they give themselves reasons why. So they're connected to their why. But it's different than just giving, like, know your why is nice. Know your why and give yourself edge for it. What do you mean? For, let me give you an example. Two guys walking out on the track field. Mm -hmm. Who's going to win? Well, 
equal quality of experience, similar times, maybe they've raced before. The guy at the blocks who I'm going to bet on is the guy who came out and said, got to do this for my mom. They have a reason to perform at heightened levels. Mm. And they have connected to that over and over. Now, again, some of this, duh, Brendan. But the finding, the research is they just do that more often than underperformers or even you know good performers. Yeah. They're more connected to their reasons why, and they're stirring it, man. It's like, and they do it from two angles. One angle is your, 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 like your internal standards. Like my values or my self-expectations say, I got to crush this because that's who I freaking am. Yeah. It's like when you walk out, you're like, you're not going to, you know, screw around on when you're playing handball. You're like, yeah, yeah. this is who I'm Lewis. I'm an athlete. Yeah. I'm going to kick some ass here. <laughs> yeah. It's that self uh -huh. expectation. Okay. Then though, they pair it with external obligation. Like my team needs me to do this. The deadline says this time. There's, there's some kind of external, mm -hmm. they don't call it pressure. My family, something bigger than themselves. Something probably. bigger than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that was another thing I was surprised by. They don't say, they, they rarely use the word pressure because they want it. Like people who use pressure, they, they, they don't want it. Mm -hmm. But high performers, I found they want, they like, they're connected. I'm doing this for a bigger cause, a bigger reason, a team. Or yeah, there's sometimes just like deadline. Like I'm... I'm an unbelievably high-performing writer when there's a deadline. Yeah, I'm yeah, a yeah. weapon, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before that, you know, I'm, I'm not always on my game. Sure. So, but if you have those reasons, so you got to have your internal reasons and your external reasons, and then your job is remind yourself of that more often. That's what's called raising necessity. And we were the first ones trying to prove that with the data. Mm. And I was pretty stunned that that, remember, these three aren't like my opinion. You might say, yeah, yeah, these are whatever. I'm like, but these ones are more important than everything else we measure. Really? These Over a hundred different habits. These are the ones that move the needle. So if you want to move the needle in your personal life, number one, seek clarity more often. Number two, generate energy with more consistency and will. And number three, raise necessity. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. For people that feel stuck or that they have these ideas or dreams for years and they never take action on them, I'm hearing you say, read more obituaries because it'll get you into realizing the people that did take action and what their life looked like and the people that didn't yeah. take action and what their life could have been had they taken action. Why, do you, just, think, yeah. why do you think it takes us so long for some people, not everyone, but for so long of us to put our ideas out there why, how is that fear of embarrassment so strong that we're willing to take it to our grave, our ideas and our dreams, and never put them out there? I think there's also an ambition gene, or there's something in people that they just want it really bad. Um, you just have to really want it. And it's not something that can be willed. John Baldessari used to say that, you know, you have to have something and that can't be willed. And, um, you know, you just have to want it more than not. You, you have to want it more than the failure would hurt. You, you know what I mean? Like the pain after, of failure, the yeah. pain of failure, like, yeah. And, and, you, but I mean, there's so many people who don't get it, you know, even if they want it really bad. Um, yeah, they never get recognized for their work. They don't get yeah. an audience. No one buys no. their stuff. But at least they put it out there. At least they created it, right? I'd rather create and have five people read or watch or listen yeah. and be proud of me putting something out there that I yeah. cared of than think about something I care about and never act on it. There And there's two things. There's the making and there's the sharing. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing is to always be making. Um, the most important thing I think is to be in love with the doing, with the verbs, the, the, the actual acts, the drib. If you want to talk in sports terms, you know, the, the dribbling, the shooting, the, the practice, the practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the sharing is another, st there's, there's always a sort of like generosity in the making in, in a sense, just because you're like. I don't know if it's generosity. Sharing is about generosity. It's about, and, and maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's, it's, 
it's putting yourself into your craft enough that you come up with something that you genuinely feel like needs to be in the world. I think a lot of people, you know, they're just not there yet. They know, and, and I think this happened to me when I was really younger. I, I mean, when I first started out, I knew I wasn't any good. I knew that I didn't have work that was good enough that anyone should care but I wanted to be part of the world like right then. And that's when I started my blog. And I, I was, you know, I was right out of college. It was like 2005 and I started going to readings. I wanted to be a fiction writer. Then I have no talent for fiction. I have no talent for inventing <laughs> things, which quickly became obvious, but I really wanted to be a fiction writer. And so I would go and I would, uh, I would go to readings by fiction writers and I would take my sketchbooks and I would draw the writers as they were reading uh, because, you know, nobody draws. I mean, people take pictures, but like nobody draws. And if you just sit in a room and don't move too much when you're drawing, no one really notices unless they're right or next to you. So it was like, it was a great thing to do. But then I took the drawings and I would post them on my blog when I got home and I met more writers that way. I can't tell you. I mean, I, I met some from really, them seeing your drawings from and being them like, seeing oh, my thank drawings. you. Because everybody has a Google alert on their right. name right. and everyone loves to be drawn. I mean, Absolutely. especially if it's not a bad drawing. I mean, people don't <laughs> if want it's a bad, bad drawing. They're drawing. like, oh, this is crap. Yeah. But if it's like a cool drawing and if you put some words underneath the drawing mm. that, that show that you were paying attention and you link to their book. Then, then, you're really, then you're really being generous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, and they're more apt to share it. So it's like, uh, that was like my way of starting is I'm going to draw other people's books. And then, so I would draw them at readings. The other thing I started doing is I started making these maps of people's books. I would actually read a book and then I would draw a map of it. Um, of like the ideas in the books and I would post that online and I That's met cool. a lot of writers that way. That's cool. So basically what I was doing was I was studying how writers were in the world and what they were doing and drawing them. But then I was also studying their books and drawing their books. And that was all just, it, it turned out to be instead of drawing other people's books. Now I draw my own books. Right. It was all the practice reps, you know, I, yeah. I've, inter I've interviewed Robert uh, Green many times and he yeah. said, I didn't start out as this writer who was writing these unique, weird, interesting type of books structured in the way that I do the 48 laws of power, the art of seduction, you know, right. mastery. He's like, I wasn't writing those books 20 years ago. I was doing copywriting for five years. Then I worked at a newspaper for a couple of years. Then I worked as a screenwriter and I was actually never great at any of these things. I was good, but it wasn't the main, it wasn't my calling, but it led me to the next thing, which led me to the next thing, which right. created this, web of of influences and range as you will of mm -hmm. creative work to then put it into my own type of work 48 laws of power artist seduction mastery you know all these things that f people loved and it took i don't know 10 15 20 years for him to develop that skill just like what it sounds like you did okay you were consuming uh, these live readings you were drawing the, them then you were mapping out their work and then you made it your own but i was a fan first yeah i was a good fan first and you get that from like if you watch old clips of like kobe bryant he'll talk about like i'm just a fan of all these people and i'm just stealing their moves and i'm just trying to do i'm trying to do the game better and kobe's one of those he was one of those guys that grew up with vhs tapes which makes it completely you know, the way I've had it explained to me is it's like when you can watch replays of other players and famous players and watch their moves, you can do study. You can study on the couch Yeah. <laughs> as a player. You know, you don't have to be like up against them to and, and that that idea that you're a fan first, that you ingest all this stuff first and you take it in and it mixes around and then through your practice, all that stuff comes gushing out eventually and it comes mm. out in a new it's like a gumbo in your head you know you're just adding stuff and eventually you ladle it out and it's something new is there such a thing as an original or new 
thought or is everything an old thought that's repackaged in an innovative way? I think there's definitely such a thing as an original thought. I don't think it's original in the way we think of it, though. I think an original thought is usually the result of what we've just been talking about. It's someone who has been usually people who have really original thoughts. And let's back up for a minute. There are lots of original thoughts. I mean, four year olds have very original thoughts all the time. It's an original thought that changes the world or that changes the you know, the, the, the field or whatever. Mm -hmm. Usually that is from someone who is deeply doing exactly what we're talking about is yeah. deeply uh, connected to either sources that came before them or, or the scene around them. Um, you know, very rarely is something I, I'm trying to think of an example of, of something that is, new and original that changes the world that comes from someone who wasn't doing the kind of work that we were talking right. about. It's have, you read, uh, have you read David Epstein's range? I love that book. I just wrote about it on my blog. I think it's a, um, Amazing I book. think it's sort of an instant classic. It's so good. What David did in that book. Uh, you know, I, I think it's uh Ryan holiday had a really good, um, he told me it was a parenting book in disguise. And I think Ryan's right. Mm, yeah. Um, that well, book, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's easy for me to love that book because it was sort of a, <laughs> it was kind of a, a validation me too. of how <laughs> I've, you know, kind of lived my life. Yeah. Um, and the fact that range can speak to like, I always think a book is really good when I'm still, first of all, if you're still thinking about a book two weeks after you read it, that's pretty good. You're thinking about it a year after you read it. That's very good. And if you think about things in the news and how they could be chapters in the book, then it's very, very good. Mm. Um, David's yeah, for... book, you know, I was reading about the Williams sisters and I thought, well, this could have been in David's book, you know, because mm -hmm. the Williams sisters were talking about how they were hanging out with the Mannings. They were like doing some sort of charity thing. And the Mannings suck at tennis. I mean, they were trying out tennis and they really were bad. But Venus was saying they had this skill from practice. You could tell that every shot they hit, they were getting like a little bit better. Every they time. were taking the feedback. Mm -hmm. And she said by the end of like how many ever hours or minutes they were together, they were okay. Right. You know, and I, I just think like that is you can see that in the creative field, too. There's something to or in the creative fields, there's something about learning what it's like to start with uh, a certain kind of time, space and materials and getting something out of it. There's something about that that translates to other mediums that you can kind of, so I, I actually think, and this is very, I think this is unpopular, this, the, this way of thinking, but I think that like, if you're like a really good writer, for example, you know, you might be an okay film editor mm. because you know what it's like to shape things. Or if you're a film editor, you might be a really good writer because you know what it's like to take material and just shape, you know what I mean? So I think there's a kind of cross-disciplinary, uh, cross-medium, I think creativity, you get it's like a thing that you do and you can do it in different realms yeah i uh i think you're right and maybe i'm just validating myself in my childhood because my parents put me in every type of sport mm -hmm. you know it was seven different sports yeah a year and so you're always going to a different thing for that season sometimes two things for that season i don't know if kids are doing that today or if that's what parents are doing now but for us back in ohio it was like okay yeah. you're doing soccer and football and you're doing baseball and basketball and you're doing this camp and swimming and tap dancing it was like i was doing every type of athletic sport there was available for me maybe because my parents were just like get out of the house and you know yeah. get out of our hair but yeah. it was probably but they didn't specialize me which i'm really grateful for because i think it's a gift. Maybe, maybe I could have been unbelievably specialized and talented at one thing, and I never was. I was always really good at all these different sports, but I was never the best on any team. Right. Maybe when I got in high school, I was like, you know, whatever, the starter and the best and, and, and stuff. But growing up, I was never the best. And it was the, the range of things that I was able to cross-pollinate to different sports and apply 
where people that I would see who were only playing basketball, they didn't have certain skills yeah. that I was able to develop. And I'm not saying I was better than them, but I was I was able to see things differently based on catching a football for three months yeah. and running routes and then applying that to basketball as opposed to them just only playing basketball and shooting shots and being on that field. And maybe they were better for a little bit as specialized, but over the season – I could apply these other range of skills to just be an overall better player, teammate, you know, those things. So I think it's important in, in every discipline that you're in to develop a range of skills. And you're going to suck at some of these things at, at points. But <laughs> yeah. I think it's important because it will make you a more interesting human in the long run. Absolutely. And there's a dark side to what you were talking about uh, with specialization, especially in sports. I mean, you see a lot of 20-year-olds like break their femur. And you're done. It, and you're just over. Because Your identity is crippled because you have no, no other thing that you're good at. That, but also the reason your femur is broken is because you only play one sport and like these a, repetitive Like a injuries. Tiger Woods just constantly hitting the ball over and over. His back is broken. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like um, – what you're talking about doing multiple sports, you're actually like building your body in different ways. Like and an off season and rest is like really, really important. This is something as a culture, I feel like we've like completely lost track of what rest is and what it means to rest and to have time off and how important rest and sleep is to complete a lot of the activities that we do. Um, the you postseason know, is, is huge. You know, yeah, there's, there's this, I mean, there's the postseason, the preseason. The it's season. part of the work. Exactly. All these things are part of the work. It's not just that the work happens in the season, like exactly. the postseason and the preseason. I mean, and I think I think the closest thing that I do to sports, I mean, other than like doing push ups or something is um, I play the piano and I'm always there comes a point practicing the piano where you're just done for the day. You're like, okay, this is, you know, you get, like, you, blah, get blah, a, blah, blah, blah. you get to a point where it's good and then it gets worse. And you say, okay, I, this is, but then you sleep on it and this magical thing happens when you go back to the keyboard the next day, you could do it. And you can and do I, it like perfectly. And you're like Bach. You're just like, blah, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> and it really feels like, I mean, your brain worked it out, you know? And I just, I believe deeply in the power of a good night's sleep on on pretty much anything yeah i'm doing that i'm learning that right now in i'm taking spanish classes it's been oh, something yeah. i've been wanting to do for 20 years and i always yep. say i'm going to do it and then i never do and so i try and i get tired and i'm exhausted and my brain hurts so much right now yeah. austin when i'm taking <laughs> these classes and i feel like i'm not improving at all most of the time <laughs> but then sometimes i take a couple of days off and i come back and I'm getting a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this, and I'm connecting the dots. And you need, you can't just force it all the time in your brain. You need that rest time as yeah. well. Yeah. What would you and say, we, to, what would you say cool. to people that are, are always in um, idea phase, always in thinking about phase, and they're not finishing work? Maybe they're doing, starting the work, but they're never finishing let alone posting or publishing or shipping, they're not even completing. And they just keep talking about, I'm writing, I'm in the process, I'm in the process. What do you say for people like that uh, on how they can actually complete something and ship it? Deadlines. I mean, for me, I've told people, I, I, so it's um, death and deadlines. So we talked earlier about death and obituaries. That's the, that's the gun to your back or the nudge, yeah. you know. But the deadline is the is the real having a deadline, even if it's artificial, is the only way to work, in my opinion, to have to show something at some point to somebody is the only thing that keeps me, you know, I've got deadlines right now that I don't even I don't even have a boss or anything, but I've got deadlines to myself. But if you're not if you don't get an advance and some publisher down your throat for a deadline how do you create that deadline? Well, I, you You're know, like, I just want to put out this blog post, right? Uh, it's not perfect yet. Well, I, I have, our, so I have internal deadlines. So for example, I try to blog every day, which is overkill, but I've noticed that when I blog every day, good things happen, uh, that 
ideas come quicker to me. I'm thinking a lot more. Um, I might not be writing a book as well, but like I'm learning a lot more. And then people are hitting the website more and that means more trap. You know, it's just like a nice stew of things. But I would say the reason I blog every day is more for my benefit uh, uh, personally, just that I learn things and I have to make things. And then when I blog them, after I've hit publish is when I realize what the piece was actually about. And then <laughs> I'm like, okay, I need to scribble more notes or have a follow-up post or this needs to be a book chapter. You know, and then the other deadline I have is every week I have to put out this newsletter. So there's, I'm always in the back of my mind. It's kind of like, well, what's the big piece for the newsletter this week? Like, what's that going to be? What have you done? You know, and so I sort of have this internal deadline editorial calendar in my head, if not on paper, that just sort of nudges me along. And I told people that a long time ago. I said, you know, I didn't start a blog because I had something to say. I had I started a blog to figure out what I had to say. Mm. Because when you're looking at that blank WordPress box or whatever it is, you're inspired to f like what do I fill this with? And that is the question, you know? And if you do that every day, and it's the same thing with a blank page. It's like you look at a blank page and you're like what could this what could be in this, you know? Um that's pretty much all I need. But the other thing is, and I say this a lot, is like discipline with desire is easy. If you want, discipline isn't that hard if you have real desire. I mean, if you want something bad enough, the discipline's not too difficult. I think discipline without desire is very difficult. But when you have the desire, I mean, you know, I... I'm always pretty self-deprecating. I don't know if it's from being from Ohio or being Midwestern or whatever it is, but at the end of the day, you know, I wanted this, you know, I wanted this really bad, <laughs> you know, um, you had the desire, you wanted to make something, I had the desire, you wanted to put it out in the world. You wanted people to recognize it, all that stuff. I wanted to be my heroes. I wanted to be, wow. I wanted to write books. You know, I just, I, I, that's what I wanted to be. I want, you know, and, and, and um, I, I'm not trying to diminish people who really want it, who it's not happened for them, because that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what we're talking about. I mean, it's one thing to go after things hard and not get them, but it's a different thing to not go after them in the first place. That's true. Which I think is usually people's. Yeah. And I've put out work that I had high hopes for. I was like, man, I put a lot of time and energy into this thing. I wrote a book called The Mask of Masculinity that came out in 2017. And I remember, or no, 2018, 2017, I think. And I remember being like, man, I, put, I spent a year and a half researching this. This is, for me, yeah. this is the most meaningful, important piece of work I've ever done in my life, yeah. piece of content. It's about masculine vulnerability how men can like tear down the walls that hold them back from feeling deeper from connecting to their partners more from having more peace and love in their heart for the world all these things i interviewed all the top researchers you know all this and it was the most vulnerable thing opening up about all these different traumas everything and it was a it was like a call to men to kind of like open up and a call for women to learn more about the men in their lives who might be guarded and I remember I was like, even if a lot of people don't read this, it's going to be my most important piece of work probably that I'll ever do uh, because of the healing that could take place for people that do read it. And I mean, it's done well, but it didn't hit the New York Times bestseller list like right. my first book. Right. And you know, so there's some let down of like, oh, I had high hopes and this and that. Yeah. And, it, and it continues to sell and do well, but it's like it didn't do as well as my first book. And I, in, a, in a little bit, I also knew that. I was like, it's more of a niche idea. It's not as broad mm -hmm. for the world. Um, it's more for people that really want to dive into this. Uh, but you still have this sense of like, okay, well, there's some there's some let down or there's some, you know, you put all this energy into something that doesn't do the way you want it. Uh, and, so, and you got to let go of that expectation, right? Absolutely you do. I mean, that happens to me with every book. I mean, the funny thing is about books is if you're lucky enough to keep them in print, 
you just don't know when a book is going to come back around. I mean, it was funny because when Keep Going came out, which is the third in the trilogy I just wrapped up, I just thought, oh, man, I nailed this. This is, this is the <laughs> like best this is my one. <laughs> this is like, this is so tight. It's like the last crusade. It's like, okay, everyone really likes Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then there's Temple of Doom, which is really tricky and whatever. But this is like the last crusade. It's like a return to form. It's like, whatever. You know, I was like, this is just gonna, this is, uh, end game. This is end game. you know, like, yeah. bam, you know, and it, it did fine and did well. And I had a wonderful book tour, but just didn't like blow up. I was like, this is the Oprah book. Like Oprah's going to get this. She's going to be like, oh, you know, you have these delusions of grandeur <laughs> in your mind as a writer. And then this really funny thing happened is like the pandemic hit. And then people started to say, I realized like, oh, this is like a pandemic guide. This is going to be like, people are going to pick this up because like the first it's groundhog day. We're talking on groundhog day. This won't play on groundhog day, but like the first chapter in that book is every day is groundhog day. <laughs> it's like everyone in the pandemic has been like, Oh man, this feels like groundhog day. I was like, well, this is the book to get through the pandemic. But then this really funny thing happened. Show your work took off my second book because people in the pandemic are like, how do I show I, I this is a great time for me to maybe like get my side hustle going or like start a new blog or a website. How do I do that? So people are like picking up show your work now and it's having like a moment mm. and it's like you just don't know with these things. And it is a great lesson in ego reduction and it's a great lesson just about art in general. And it's been true of every artist who's ever put work out in the world, the stuff that is the closest to you is not the stuff that will take off. Interesting. And the stuff that you feel like is you just piddling around <laughs> playing is going to be the stuff that everybody loves. Everybody's going to love that stuff. And you just have to balance out. It's just about making a lot of work and putting it out there. What should I do with my life? That's a real complicated question. Right. Oh, here's an inadequacy. Excellent. You have a pl you have a, a goal now. Rectify it. Now you still have to think strategically and figure out how to rectify it and do it step by step. And but 